I invite you now to join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, as we have gathered here together in this our sacred space, we're mindful of those, especially those in war torn areas who are unable to do that. And our hearts and our prayers are lifted up for them. And now as we have gathered and we have extended our hands for handshakes and hugs, we've lifted our hearts and hands and voices in worship. May you be with us now as we break open an ancient story and may we hear it in a modern way. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, David was riding pretty high on coming off the heels of his coronation as king, and things were going okay for a little while until they weren't going okay. David's life and David's kingship kind of started on this downward spiral, this downward trajectory, going from a really high moment and slowly going to a really low moment. I don't know, have you been there? I have. We've all had moments like that. But in David's life, there was the, the infamous incident with Bathsheba. And then his children started to do all things to each other, and they decided to rebel against him, and so that made his life difficult. And then his son Solomon was God's appointed person to take David's place as king when David's rule was over. Solomon was the child that David fathered with Bathsheba, and he has kind of the same trajectory in his own kingship. He builds the temple, which is something that his father was not able to do. Um, he has some amazing, an amazing beginning to his rule as king, but then things in his life started to take a downward spiral, especially in 1 Kings chapter 11, which is toward the end of his reign. It tells us that he's married a lot of women, he fell into some frown upon frown practices, and God becomes very angry with Solomon and decides that maybe Solomon is not the best person to rule the kingdom. However, God had made this promise with Solomon that he would never take the kingdom away from him. And so when Solomon dies, God decides to take part of the kingdom away from Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who is now going to be the king of a now, once again, divided kingdom. But there was another Boam at that time named Jeroboam, and God gave Jeroboam 10 of the tribes of Israel for him to rule. And Jeroboam had worked for Solomon for many years and was kind of the orchestrator or the organizer for some of the manual labor and the forced labor that Solomon had instituted when he was king of the United Kingdom. And so Rehoboam only has, Solomon's son only has two, king, two tribes, excuse me, in the kingdom to rule over. And these two men are at odds with each other throughout their whole kingship. Jeroboam knows what it is like to live under an oppressive rule. And the people are saying, we want a king who will protect us. We want a king who will free us from this bondage, free us from this oppression that we have experienced. And Jeroboam and Rehoboam both seek advice from people, but we have no indication that they sought any advice or any guidance from God. And so they try each to do the best that they can do under the circumstances. And our text today, picks up right where Rehoboam is about to have his own 
coronation as king over two of the tribes of the twelve tribes of Israel. So I invite you into our reading in 1 Kings chapter 12. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. Now, if you remember last week when we were discussing David, Rehoboam's father, David had made the capital where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So it's interesting to me that Rehoboam goes to Shechem rather than to Jerusalem to become king. But again, the kingdom is no longer united. It is a divided kingdom. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from King Solomon. Even though he worked for King Solomon and was the orchestrator of his forced labor, he was even afraid and had fled. He returned from Egypt. So they went for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten this harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. This is a people that is indeed appealing. They have had a very difficult time under King Solomon, and they think maybe his son is going to give us some relief. And Rehoboam answers, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked him, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young man who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My, father's laid on, my father laid on you a heavy yoke, and I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejected the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord, to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebai, through Ahijah, the Shalomites. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What, shall do, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel, look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. The people are in need of healing. And they come hoping that they would find that healing in a new leader. But they found just the opposite. They found someone that was even more harsh. They found somebody that was even more difficult to follow. And for some of the tribes of Israel, that was fine because Jeroboam was their leader. But for the people who Rehoboam ruled over, it was about to get even more difficult. As many of you that have been here, for any length of time, know that when we have a fifth Sunday, there's a healing service portion of our service. And it's, it's following our services, some of the deacons will be here to offer healing prayers for you at any time. And one of the reasons we do that is because we know that any one of us at any time in our life finds ourselves in need of healing. 
any one of us sitting in this sacred space will find ourselves from time to time hurting. We'll find ourselves from time to time worn out from just the heaviness that we have to carry each and every single day. On any given Sunday in this sanctuary, somebody in here is fighting a battle that we know nothing about. And so there is need of healing. But as I reflected on these passages, specifically thinking about the people at that time that were in need of healing and were asking for healing, I think about the number of people that walk into places of worship each and every week looking for that healing and only find harsh judgment. <laughs> only find harsher judgment than they had encountered in other places. I believe that our sanctuaries should be just that, a sanctuary a brave space where we can come and bring every bit of who we are and that includes our doubts our fears our frustrations our anger our joy our concerns our faith our doubts we can bring all of that into this space and i feel like we are failing if we don't allow people to do that in a safe environment. I've said it to you over and over and over again as you leave here. I hope you live, leave here feeling better than you did when you came in. Because here's what I know. For many of us, this sacred hour that we have together is the breath that we need to get us through what we're going to face in the days to come. We are a people in need of healing. And you don't have to go very far to see that. Just turn on the news. I was gutted this week to hear of yet another mass shooting, this time in Maine, where people, young people, who were gathered at a bowling alley became victims of gun violence. People at a local bar who were gathered with friends became victims of gun violence. And then I turn on the news this morning and it's even closer to home with a shooting in Ybor City early this morning, leaving two dead and 19 wounded. All because two groups got into an argument. We are a people in need of healing. We are a country in need of healing. And yes, we are a church in need of healing. We are not immune to the pressures of the world outside of us. And as I was talking to some of you this morning, I don't know who it was I was talking to now, but I said, I barely recognize the world that we live in today. It is a far cry from what I remember when I was younger. And that could be because people are changing. It could be because we have more access to the news and we hear more about it. But I know that we are in need of healing. Not only as a country, not only as a church, not only as a world, but as individuals. Each and every single one of us in this room this morning is either in need of healing or knows someone who is. You have someone on your heart, you have someone on your mind. Just like the people who came to Rehoboam and said, please take this away from us. Please make the world better for us. Just like they were in need of healing, so are we. 